بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم و بهی نستعین ثم السلام على سیدنا و نبینا ابی القاسم المصطفى محمد و على آله الطیبین الطاهرین Dear sisters and brothers, salamun alaykum. I hope you are all keeping well. It's so nice to see you again. God knows how much I missed you. Um, I'm also very grateful to Shababu Septain, the organizers, the volunteers, for giving me the opportunity to continue what we started in Ramadan. Um, some of you may be, may have, may have been there with us in, during the month of Ramadan in the series we had on Ensan. Um, some of you maybe not, but inshallah the goal is to pursue the discussion we started then, but to go deeper. So even if you haven't watched the Ramadan ones, inshallah this would be an independent standalone series. But the aim is to go much deeper. So in the month of Ramadan we spoke about Ensan how religion came to create the inner change, not just some external actions and rituals, and how what's inside us changes the way we see the outside world. We spoke about all of that, but inshallah, in this Muharram, we are gonna go much deeper. We're gonna be talking about things that hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a new understanding of yourself, of religion, of the Ahlul Bayt, their teachings, of God, and more importantly, this world. So uh, please recite a salawat. Such a lovely vibe they've created. I don't know about you, but just being here, I feel very spiritual. Um, so it's such an opportunity, you know, we're here together at least for the next 40 to 45 minutes, we have an opportunity to maybe reflect on things that could change our life. So I really ask of you to, uh, if you can give all your attention to me, or at least 90% of it, hopefully we're here to achieve some things, you know? My main motto, which is something I've learned from the Ahlul Bayt, is that things are only useful if they change us, right? So now that, for the love of Imam Hussein that's written here as well, we've been given the opportunity to come here and spend time on our own self-growth and development, an opportunity that we owe it to Imam Hussein and our love to him. Let us make the most out of it and reflect, take on what has been said and see if it has the power to change us or not. Tonight's topic and the title for tonight is called The Forgotten Depth of Religion. It's going to be mainly an introduction to the rest of the series, but even as its own, I'm hoping it would be beneficial for you. Um, another point which I said again in Ramazan is that all of these 10 nights are gonna be linked to each other. So if you like tonight, make sure you continue because I'm hoping together with all these 10 nights achieve something. One of the things we're seeing a lot these years is I'm sure you must have seen it as well. There's a rise of interest in spirituality, right? And that's not just for religious people, even non-religious people. There's even books about how to have spirituality without faith, how to have spirituality without God. But just there has been an increase, a large increase in interest in spirituality, in finding meaning in life, in purpose, in wisdom. There are even so many books. If you look at some of the um, bestseller books, a lot of them have to do with these kind of things. Self-transcendence, um, how to be a stoic. I don't know, all of these things, how to um, have a meaningful life, how to find your purpose. It seems like there is a strong interest in these kind of things, even for people who don't have religion, but even for religious people. They're finding, okay, how can I change my life for spirituality? There's so much interest in um, mindfulness, in meditation. Even academically, in psychology, in cognitive science, there's so much work being done on wisdom. You would not believe it. I mean, unless you're working on it, which you'd probably believe it. Things that previously would read, for example, in the hadith by Imam Qasim about hikmah, 
Some of its details are now being studied in cognitive science. So many researchers are focusing on wisdom. So there seems to be a very strong rise in interest in these things. And at the same time, even things like psychedelics, both academically and in the public, you know, um, even the medical health care, we see that right now they're using psychedelics to deal with, for example, treatment-resistant addictions. Many people who cannot quit their addictions through the use of psychedelics, of course, in a professional medical setting, they have been helped. Even um, dealing with trauma, the rate of healing PTSD increases from 20% to 80% with the use of psychedelics. So you see that there is a all-round interest in figuring out solutions to live better, a more meaningful life, that can be found not just in the everyday aspect of life. It seems that humanity is thirsty to go deeper than this whole routine of job, promotion, study, like houses, cars, etc. It seems like people want to go deeper. And at the same time that this is happening, we see another side to this, which is what a lot of scholars are now calling the mental health crisis. Suicide rates are higher than they've ever been. They're spiking. There's a lot of expressions of frustration, cynicism, futility. There is a kind of lost sense of touch with reality. A lot of people feel like their life doesn't make sense. They don't know what they should be doing in this world. Why am I here? What should I do? There's all sorts of books written on convincing people to stay alive. One of the books I picked up by one of the great authors, Matt Haig, a few, day, a few years ago, Reasons to Stay Alive. Imagine a, a, an organism, a living organism who is literally, whose goal is to remain alive, continue its life and survive, has reached a place where it's asking, why should I live? Even though everything in our body is designed to sustain its life. But still, we've reached a place that a lot of people, they don't know why they should live. Why should I continue life in this world full of pain, full of suffering, full of loneliness, full of isolation? And... Some of you may think that, okay, this is for non-religious people. This is for people with low faith, with weak iman. If you have iman, if you have a good relationship with God, you know what you're doing here. You won't be depressed. Someone may say that. But unfortunately, that's not the case. In fact, recently, an article was published by a great team of Muslim psychologists I think headed by Dr. Rania Awad in America. They published it in the Journal of American Medical Association. And it showed that the rate of attempted suicide in the adult Muslims was twice as higher than other faiths and people of no faith. And I'm not saying that we know the answers why this is the case. There needs to be much more studies even Islamophobia could have a role in that. There may be so many reasons. But it is, but it is definitely a wake-up call when you hear attempted suicide rates is twice as higher than any other faith group or even people of no faith and in, in the Muslims, that is the situation. So this whole idea that this meaning crisis, this sense of darkness, this sense of isolation from the world, loss, um, this loss of touch with reality can only be sold through faith, at least not the faith we have right now. And now you may be saying, okay, maybe those Muslims were not religious, but I actually went through the article with a lot of like, attention. Most of the people who participated in that study considered religion to be a very important part of their life. So it's not like they were even indifferent to religion or they didn't care enough or maybe they weren't religious enough. No, they were super religious, at least a great number of them, but still they had all the problems they had. So what's happening? 
So inshallah, in this series, I want to talk about this. What happened to us? Why are so many of us suffering and why is religion not helping? At least if it's not making things worse, it's not helping either. And so I'm hoping that during the series we can learn what happened to us, how we got stuck in the surface of religion and we lost a lot of its depth. And this was the thing that caused us all the problems we have, how we're not benefiting from so much gems and wisdom that religion can play in our life. Please recite the salawat. Okay, let me tell you about another study because I want to use that study as an introduction to speak about a hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam. There was another study done a few years ago that has nothing to do with Muslim communities. It was an, about a native tribe in a different country, okay? Now, they realized that the suicide rate in that native tribe is very little, close to zero. And that was quite a shock because the close vicinity of that native tribe, the people who were living in the urban places and the cities, they had quite a, the normal rate of suicide, which is obviously more than zero. And it was very interesting, how come it's zero here? And then the research continued focusing on this tribe, and after a while, what happened is that some of these native tribes who had these isolated lives joined together so maybe four or five tribes joined together and started living together. And the interesting thing was that as soon as that happened, their suicide rates went not the same as cities, even higher than that. So from zero, as soon as they joined other tribes, they went even higher than other places. Now one of the things that Chandler, one of the lead researchers on this study pointed out, was that one of the things they lost once they left that isolated community and became part of a larger whole was the narrative that made their life make sense, okay? Previously, they had stories that were being transferred from one generation to another generation, you know? They all had a shared identity in their small tribe. And their life made sense. They had a past, you know, this is where our ancestors came from. This is what our ancestors do, the difficulties they had to go through for us to have this life. And they had an image of where to go. And this is a future that we're gonna create for our children. Yeah. They had a narrative within which their life made sense. The story. But as soon as they joined the other tribes, then it was no longer that they could benefit from that narrative because now they were next to people from another tribe with a different narrative, with a different story, with a different background, with a different identity. So slowly, slowly, because they didn't have a shared version of a shared story to make sense of what the hell they're doing in this world, slowly, slowly they lost it and their present moment becomes disconnected from a future and the past, which is also the case for many immigrants because they're, you know, they're uprooted from the place in which their families lived for many years, where they have stories, where the buildings, the streets have all stories of what their ancestors did. So they're disconnected from the past, and they're in a place in which it's very difficult for them now to imagine a future based on all these different changes and all the changes which are happening so rapidly. And this meant that their present moments could not be understood. They couldn't make sense of their life at that moment. And this was the reason why their suicide rates jumped off the roof. Now, why did I mention this story? As breaking, as heartbreaking as it is, as sad as it is, as shocking as it is, how is it relevant to us? I want to say that the thing which happened to that tribe on a smaller scale of not knowing what was their past, of not knowing what's their future, just being stuck in this present moment which can be filled with pain, with isolation, with heartbreak, with illnesses, with nothing to look forward to, the same thing that happened to them on a larger scale, it's happening to the whole of humanity. Humanity as a whole has lost a narrative that can sustain it's life that can give it meaning, that you can use to make sense. Now, a lot of you may right now say, hang on a second, what we have. 
Muslims have, religious people have, we have a story. We were created by God, and then, you know, in the whole story of Adam, Adam ate the apple, and then that happened, and so that's our past. This is our present, and our future is heaven, right? You may say, we have a story, we have a narrative, and we're here in this world to, to be tested. This world is a test, see? I just gave you a narrative, it makes sense. But the problem with this narrative is that as evidence shows us, as our own lives show us, it's no longer working. It's in our head, but it's not in our heart. And that's why many of us, as soon as we go through a very difficult time, it, the narrative is not strong enough to sustain us through those difficult times. It doesn't carry us because it's just in our head, right? You know that whole beautiful line that's attributed to Imam Ali alayhi salam, Rahmallah imra'an arfa min ayn fi ayn wa ila ayn. Blessed be the person who knows their past, where they are right now, and where they're going, which is exactly the solution we need for the meaning crisis. It's exactly what that tribe lost and suddenly their life stopped making sense. We need to know, we need to live within a narrative that makes sense. Make sense of what was our past. Where did we come from? What, do, what are we doing here? Honestly, have you thought about it? What are we doing here? We just grow up, have children, cry in pain, we have heartbreaks, work for money, your boss gets mad at you, go back to, go work, back to work again, again. Oh, look for weekends, and then weekend comes, you have to do laundry, you have to, it's just so boring, full of pain. What's the point of all of this? And then where are we going? Well, you're going to heaven or hell and all of that. But you're seeing that increasingly, even though we believe in this narrative in our mind, it doesn't do anything in our heart because we haven't managed to pass this narrative to the next generation in a way that they can live it. It's not livable. Now, a lot of people from all the generations, they may say, no, 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 for me, I'm living it. And I tell my kid, you know, no, daddy lives this narrative. But your kid's not going to live it if you just tell. And so this is why I want to talk about tonight about this idea that we have what uh, a scientist that I'm going to be using a lot in addition to Allama Taba Taba'i to explain what I'm going to be explaining the following nights. So a lot of what we're saying is Quran and Ahl Bayt, most of it. How are we, which, which commentary are I using to make the sense of the Ahadith and the Quran? Allama Taba Taba'i's commentary, most of it. So all the credit goes to him. If there's any mistake, it's my understanding, my shortcoming. But I'm also going to be using language to be able to convey what I want to say, right? And I'm using a lot of cognitive science borrowed from Professor John Verveke, and you'll see why. You'll see how it will help me to explain the hadith of Imam Ali better so that it sits in your heart, okay? That's my goal, to be able to make sure this narrative, the religion we have, is not just something in our head, but something that comes to our heart so that we can live a better, meaningful life. So, one of the things that's happened, and it's called fundamental forgetting, is that knowledge, and unfortunately religion, has been reduced to propositional knowing, propositional knowledge. What do I mean by propositional knowledge? It says, it's a kind of knowledge that's it, it's only a sentence. Something you can tell to other people. God exists. God is great. God loves you. Even if you don't feel it, it doesn't matter. You're saying it. You could even come here and give a lecture about how God loves you, but inside, you don't feel God's love, right? Propositional knowledge is a knowledge that just gives you truths and facts. It doesn't make you feel like this knowledge is significant. How? We all know we die, don't we? But do you feel that? Are you faced with the urgency that in few years or maybe in few days or maybe even tonight we could die? No. We know it. Propositional knowledge. It doesn't have any impact on us. When does it go deeper than that? When, for example, a loved one passes away or one of our friends 
or we're carrying the body or we see the photo of a friend who's no longer with us and it hits us. Have you been hit like that? That's a knowledge that's deeper than prepositional knowledge. When you see a loved one die, death goes deeper than just a sentence. And I'm saying here tonight that religion is way deeper than these sentences that God is great, that alhamdulillah. Behind every one of these sentences, there's so much depth. But we're lost at the surface. We're so stuck at the surface that it doesn't do anything for us. In the same way that giving 10 lectures about love will do nothing for you unless you fall in love. So I want to speak about this idea that if we want to fix this meaning crisis, if we want to be able to benefit from religion in a way that helps us make sense of our life and pass it on to our children in a way that they would love it, we need to go beyond its surface and go to its depth. And it's so beautiful that Imam Ali in a khutbah that you can find in Usul al-Kafi, he's looking at the future and he says a time will come for you in which a lot of people will recite the Quran but no one's going for its meaning. Mosques are going to be built so beautifully empty of guidance. And then there's a line in another khutbah, Imam Ali says something which I just got so shook reading that. I was like, this is it. He says there will be nothing left of haq but its name, which is exactly what I'm saying. All we have of religion right now is its surface. We need to go deeper, and it breaks my heart because all the energy that we have to spend on going deeper, finding God in a real way that changes our life, we're spending on what? On the surface and fighting over the words. Sometimes I'm watching YouTube videos, a debate between, for example, a Muslim and an atheist debating whether God exists or not. And I watch both of them and I cry inside because I know none of them have experienced God. They don't know how much they have in common. They're debating, one side says God exists, the other one says God doesn't exist. And none of them have felt God in their life. It's just a preposition for them. And it shows, it shows in their action. Because if you actually felt God in your life in a very real sense, in the depth of the meaning, you would have been a different person. Because it's not like you can change deeply and then still continue living as you were living before. It's not like you can fall in love and still act the same way. No, falling in love changes you. Believing in God should change you. If you're going out fighting with people, humiliating them, cheering for your group, not listening to the other people, oh, we defeated them, you don't believe in God. That's just prepositional knowledge. So, I want to speak about this idea that there are four levels of knowledge. The first one was prepositional, right? We spoke about it. It gives you a lot of truths, a lot of facts. God exists. God is great. All the praise is due to God, right? Um, love is beautiful. I don't know. Don't be angry. Anger is bad. Anger hurts you. Anxiety makes your life difficult. All the facts. But these facts don't empower you, right? Facts don't empower you. Okay, I know anger is bad for me. What do I do with that now? How can I stop my anger? I know anxiety is, is making my life difficult. How do I stop that? See, facts don't empower. Second form of knowledge is procedural knowledge, right? It empowers you. It tells you how to do things, right? And, and that's another step going deeper. And this is something that I've been trying so much to tell people. That if a hadith says, for example, anger is bad, don't just go around telling people anger is bad. Give them the procedural knowledge, the procedure of getting rid of your anger. Empower people through that. Because I could know all these facts about anger is bad, being heart, breaking hearts is bad, waking up late is bad. But if you don't empower me to change myself, if you don't give me the skill, I need to fix that. What's the point of all of, the, all of that knowledge? So the second layer is procedural knowledge. See, it's one layer deeper than the surface. And that's something we're lacking. That's something we need to bring back in our religion. And we'll talk about it more in these next 10 days. Right? If you want to tell your child, for example, With the remembrance of God, your heart finds peace. Okay, at the level of propositional knowledge, this gains you nothing. Because you're just being told that through remembrance of God, your hearts find peace. 
Okay, whose heart right now has found peace through the remembrance of God? So you have to go deeper in the verse, give people the way to do that, to find that peace through remembrance of God, the procedure. But it doesn't end there. You can even go deeper, right? From procedural, we can go to perspectival knowledge. What does that mean? Okay, there are so many things I can learn, so many different ways in which I can empower myself. Well, I can work on my anger. I can learn the skill to, for example, be a more assertive, be a better salesperson. I can, there are so many skills I can learn, so many ways in which I can empower myself. Which ones are more important to me? You should know that. We need to get to a place where the person has a perspective at world and they know what matters. Okay, all these skills in the world, it's just so overwhelming. Which ones do I need? Do I work on being a better salesperson, on both of them, better partner, better child, better salesperson? What would they do? There's so many skills. So you need to have a kind of deeper knowledge, a kind of wisdom inside that you look at the world and you can figure out, okay, these are the ones that matter. These are the kinds of skills that I need to learn. Perspective on knowledge. You have a perspective at world. But you can even go deeper, and the solution can only be found at that deepest of the levels. What is the deepest level? Participatory knowledge. By the way, don't let the terms like uh, confuse you or anything. Terms are, forget about the terms, it's just a, what I'm saying, it matters, right? Participatory knowledge is a knowledge that's not just a sentence, it's not propositional. It's not a skill like procedural. It's not a perspective. It's about the way you feel in the world. It's about the way you are fitted to this reality. Do you remember initially I said one of the things which is happening right now is a lot of people think like, what's the point of this whole world? What should I do? Why is so much pain in the world? What's happening? What do you do here? Do you listen to Elon Musk and try, and try to go to Spade? Do you listen to these religious people and try to go to heaven? What do you do? What do I do with my pain? What do I do? What, 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 do you go and help other countries who are poor? Do you try to make, become rich here? Do you take one of these spiritual paths and try to meditate and think that all the pains are just what's happening in the attitude and fix that? What do you do in this world? This is participatory knowledge. We've lost a sense of thinking we belong in this world, and this is the deepest sense of knowledge that we need to get to, right? And it's not like we haven't felt this, by the way. Some of us, we have felt this every now and then. Maybe some of you, after a spiritual stage in your life, for example, you went to Karbala or Arba'in or Hajj, suddenly, you may not even knew these words. Probably you didn't. But you felt that now, Life makes sense. I feel like, oh, I feel like, yes, I'm part of this world. And my, my existence makes sense. My life makes sense. Despite all the pain, despite all the suffering, there's something in me at the most existential level that I feel like life makes sense. Which is what in that hadith the Prophet says, the Prophet said in every single person's life, at least once it will come, where they will feel this, that life in this world makes sense, where no one needs to give you reasons why to stay alive or why you should be alive or what to do. It makes sense, right? These are the moments we call the spiritual moments of our life. Yaqve, you, hey, wake, you up. wake up, oh, there's more to life than I thought. In Islamic spirituality, they call this yaqve, awakening. Right? So a lot of us have had this. We just didn't know what to call it. And another problem is, it's not like we knew a path to get there. We didn't have the technology to get there whenever we want. We stumbled upon it. It happened to us accidentally. Maybe in one trip to Hajj, but then the next time it didn't work. Maybe once in, in, in the month of Ramadan. Maybe once in the Laylatul Qad. But we don't know how to create it again. And one of the fears most people who experience yaqve is, oh, what if I lose it? What if I lose it? How do I create it again? Right? So that's why we've had this kind of participatory knowledge in which we feel like we are fitted to the world. But we don't know the ways to keep making that, to keep getting to that level where life makes sense. How to give that to our children then? 
Maybe we had it because we were born in a culture in which these things were passed on so normally. But now how do I tell that to my, to my child? I told them, see, I mean, life makes sense. God exists. But all you're offering is prepositional knowledge. What technology do we have to give our children more than words, to give them what our grandmas felt in their heart, you know? I don't know if you had these grandmas or not. They had these knowledge, these religion was so deep in them, they didn't even know maybe how to articulate it. But you would go to them and say, this has happened, they were like, inshallah khair. Not like the inshallah khair I would say, which is basically meaningless. She felt it in all her heart that God is loving, that everything ultimately will make sense. But then we lost how to transfer this to the next generation, or even to ourselves, to be honest with you. Right? Because we got stuck at prepositional. And Imam Ali said, a time will come where nothing will be left of haq apart from its name. Now, what inshallah we're trying to do in these 10 nights, one of which is already gone, is to see if we can go deeper in religion. And I want to argue and put forth this argument, which again, it's not mine, it's from our great scholars, that the path of Ahlul Bayt was a path to go deep in religion. I want to argue that the reason the Prophet said, Kitab Allah wa itrati, my Quran and my Ahlul Bayt, is because Ahlul Bayt were meant to be the reminders for us not to get stuck at the surface of religion and go deep. And once we talk about this, we'll realize that unfortunately, we didn't help the Ahl al-Bayt in their goal. Even though they wanted us to go deep, unfortunately, a lot of us were stuck still at the surface. But it's never late because we still have their words and wisdom and we can benefit from it to go deeper. And I want to give you a few examples so you see how much their hearts were broken that people were so stuck at surface. You have this from the Prophet, a hadith that a lot of people say, We, the Prophets, the, pro the Prophet says, we speak to people based on how much depth they're ready for. A lot of us have heard this. I'm like, okay, well, hadith, Prophet says we'll speak to people as much as they're ready for depth. They don't pay attention that the Prophet is saying, I have so much more. <laughs> Why are you not getting more ready so I can offer you more? More depth. And Allah Taba Taba, he says, this is not more in terms of quantity. This is more in terms of quality. Imam Ali alayhi salam. In that battle, they're like, should we go to the Quran? Imam Ali tells them what? See, if we go to the Quran, they're so stuck at the surface of the Quran that you cannot argue with them. Because people who get stuck at the surface, they can't see the truth. Imam Ali tells them, see, there's no point arguing with them with the Quran because they're so stuck at the surface. Asan Ahl al-Bayt's whole journey, or at least one of their biggest mission is to take people to the depth. Who are the people who killed Imam Hussein? People stuck at the surface. What do I mean by the surface? They were saying all the things. God exists. They were even doing all the surface of the acts because even actions have surface. They were praying. Many of them were hufaz of Quran. They would walk for hajj. Imagine how difficult that would be walking to hajj. They had done all of that. The people stuck at surface of religion killed Imam Hussein. So you can see Ahl al-Bayt's mission was to take people deeper because at the surface you are not saved. At the surface it's what's happening right now. Okay? Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, he says the same thing. Imam Sajjad says, I have gems of wisdom and knowledge that if I share Muslims will kill me. Imam Sajjad is saying that. Doesn't your heart just break that he was so ready to share? Doesn't it remind you of Imam Ali who said, I have my chest is full of secrets and mysteries that I wish someone was ready so I could share it with them. We have the same thing from Imam Baghir. Imam Baghir says, Wallah, I have so much. I wish people were ready. I could share it with them. There's so much depth in this religion. Imam Sadiq, the same thing. A person goes to ask a question. Imam Sadiq says, if I answer you, the answer is so deep, you're not ready for it. You may kill me or may become kafir. See? It breaks the heart. They had so much more to offer. People were so busy with other things. When Mamali told them, ask me anything, they asked what? How many hairs do I have? That's the problem we have right now. They didn't allow the Ahl to share those depths. But still it's accessible because they've left us enough, enough codes, enough secrets that we can get into it. Even Quran itself is still there. Didn't you have all heard that Quran has seven batn, seven inner depths? Okay, where is that? 
Does it have that or not? What's the point of knowing that if we can't access it? I'm saying it is possible to access that. And now a lot of people may say, okay, if people were not ready at that time, then maybe these things should not have been said. But that's not the case. The famous hadith from the Prophet, he said at the end of the time, people will come who will understand Qul Allah better than anyone else at this time. And I want to tell you that we are not at a time in which we can think whether we should do this or not. We are so desperate for this depth of religion because our prayer is not changing us. We read Quran, it doesn't do anything to us, right? The Laylatul Qad comes, we feel a little bit high, but honestly, check your life right now and before Laylatul Qad, we were all together for the nights of Qad. How much have we changed, right? So many things are happening to us, but we're not being changed. We need this depth. And it's so interesting, I, looked, I told Javadi Amuli, once they told him, uh, why do you speak of these deep and difficult, complicated stuff? Why don't you bring your level lower? And he said, how may, how, for how long should we bring our levels lower? Let's bring everyone up. Because he had seen what happened, that all the Imams were heartbroken that they couldn't share the depth. One of the greatest scholars of the history of Shia, Allama Taba Tabai, whose alim is on, is the pride for the Shias that now we have such great tafsir of the Quran. In his own life, he was isolated. He, he, he wasn't free to say whatever he wants. Even some of his classes, he was like, well, some people may... Because people around the Ahlul Bayt and then our scholars were sometimes so stuck at the surface Anyone who wanted to pay a little bit more, share a little bit more, they would attack them. So now, inshallah, what we need to do and what we aim to do is following the line that Imam Hussein said when he wrote to Muhammad Hanafiya before he left for Karbala. He said, Imam Hussein wanted to show people who were so stuck at the surface that this is not religion. There's so much more to it. He said, I have not come to take power. I've not come to fight with anyone. I've not come for any personal gain. I want to reform the Ummah of the Prophet. And a lot of people are scared of reform. What is reform? Does reform mean to change religion? Not at least the way Ahl Bayt did it. Reform in the language of Ahl Bayt is not changing religion. No, in fact, it's going back to it. It's going back to it and going deeper in it. Because the surface, you can have it and kill Imam Hussein. The surface, you can have it and still feel miserable. You still have so much pain. Still life doesn't make sense. Right? And let me just give you one example, and then inshallah tonight's lecture would be over, of just how simple sometimes it is to go to the depth. And how, how much it may seem like you have religion and we don't. The verse in the Quran, Idfa. Well, I hope I pronounced it correctly. It says, if someone did a bad thing to you, pay back to them or reply with something that's the best. Not better than that bad act. No, no. The best. What does that mean? You're at home, your child comes, and your child is tired, maybe had a bad day at school, and says something to you. Oh, daddy, why are you doing that? Or whatever. Now, as daddy, what do you do? Do you shout back? Why are you talking to daddy like that? Don't disrespect me. Okay, that's sayya from him, badness from your child, badness from you. Quran says what? Itfa billati hiya ahsan. Not even hasan. Hasan would be what? Your child says something rude, you don't say anything. That's better than being rude. Hasan is good. But Quran says, reply badness with the best you can. Not a good thing, not being silent. If you can even be nicer and go ask her, what was your day like? What happened, sweetie? Is, is everything okay? Do you want to talk to me? That's ahsan, the best you can manage. And I'm not saying that's easy, by the way. It's, again, propositional knowledge. We need to go procedural, learn how to. But I'm saying, do you see the difference that just saying this, reciting this, the difference between just reciting this and creating families that actually live like that. Do you know the difference between that is the difference between heaven and hell? Family who one of them comes home tired, poor thing, long day outside, and is a little bit grumpy, a little bit 
rude. The other one's like, why are you talking to me? You think I had an easy day? Fight, 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 hell. And another family, one of them comes home a little bit grumpy, tired. And the other one goes, okay, what's wrong? Do you need help? Just one simple line of the Quran. Imagine if we had gone from the surface to its depth, how much our lives would have been different. Now I'm saying the whole of religion is like this. With salam, with Quran, with prayer, with all the ahadith, with ad'iyah. We're stuck at the surface and inshallah, through the help of Imam Hussein, the guidance of God and your support in the next following nights, we'll try to go to its death. And we are so grateful that we are, I, at least with myself, I don't want to say follower because their standard is so high. But like it says here, a lover of Ahlul Bayt, a lover of Imam Hussein. And I think I have a long, long way to be able to say I'm following them in my action. But inshallah, maybe through their help, through their prayers, and through the help of God, at least in these next 10 days, we become more and more followers of them in our real life. Please recite the salawat.